Broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone. My name is Ryan Eborn, and I am here today on behalf of the marketing team with School Health. I'd like to thank everyone for attending today's webinar, uh, and also thank our uh, presenter, Laura Lee Olenek, and our uh, partner in presenting today's webinar, Cardiac Science. I want to start off uh, uh, with a little bit about Laura Lee, who um, uh, is, is helping us out today. Laura Lee is a program associate for San Diego Project Heartbeat, which is a public access defibrillation program that has been created by the San Diego Fire Rescue Department and American Medical Response. In this webinar, we will learn the fundamentals of establishing a campus AED program, even when there are limited resources. We will talk about your role in AED education, maintenance, and compliance. We will discuss how you can expand and enhance your existing AED programs in your schools, including getting the buy-in from key stakeholders, and we will discuss large-scale student CPR training and talk about some AED success stories on campus. And finally, you will have a chance to ask questions with Laura Lee and have your questions answered uh, with the hopes that you can leave with a clear action plan for your AED program. And let's not forget that today's attendees will be entered to win a free PowerHeart AED uh, trainer. It's a PowerHeart G5 AED trainer. Uh, it's an excellent tool for teaching basic AED rescue skills and correct defibrillation procedures. This AED training device is valued at over $400 and was donated by Cardiac Science, our partner in today's webinar. We'd like to thank them for their support uh, and for their dedication to saving lives. Um, for the attendees of the webinar today, we will be drawing for that AED trainer later this afternoon, and we will notify the winner uh, of the trainer um, after the drawing. Before I turn the time over to Laura Lee, uh, I want to run over a quick uh, couple of things about today's webinar. Um, first of all, we will not be taking audio questions. Uh, but there is a questions interface in GoToWebinar. You can submit your questions at any time during the presentation. And in the last 15 minutes uh, of the presentation, we will uh, review the questions and give Laura Lee a chance to answer. Um, the webinar will be recorded, and we will have a link available uh, to the recording after we have completed uh, the webinar. It will be posted on our YouTube uh, site, and we will email that link to you for future playback. Everyone who attends the webinar will also receive a certificate of attendance. Uh, you should expect to receive that by email in about three or four days. And uh, lastly, if you're having technical difficulties with the audio or visual portion of today's webinar, please call GoToWebinar directly at 855-352-9008. And now let's get started. I'd like to welcome Laura Lee to the broadcast. Hi, thank you everyone for joining today. We're going to start off today by watching a YouTube video of a high school volleyball game. During the game, one of the players collapsed after experiencing a sudden cardiac arrest. Let's watch. <clears throat> A high school volleyball game is underway outside Atlanta. The play is intense, but friendly. Then a moment of utter horror. A senior suddenly collapses. You can actually hear the thud as she hits the hardwood floor. She lies there, lifeless, and everyone runs to her side. The teen is in full cardiac arrest. One coach performs CPR, but it's not working. It's looking grim for 17-year-old Claire Crawford. Then somebody rushes in with a defibrillator. There it is. It's in the black box. Sure enough, you can see Claire's body jolt from the electric charge. Julie Sermons is the quick-thinking school administrator who used the defibrillator. Life started to come back um, in her, and it was, it was wonderful to see. 
And so there you go, a worst case scenario situation. You have a student who is involved in kind, some kind of sporting activity and they collapse. Does your school have an action plan? Are you ready? Are you personally ready to respond to this? That's what we're going to be talking today. Running AED programs successfully. How do you make your campus community as safe as you can when the worst case scenario happens? Next slide, please. <clears throat> I want to start off with another case study here from the San Diego area where I'm from. This is from Escondido, California, a little bit north of San Diego. Uh, in that photo, you see 14-year-old Ian Quinones. He's a middle schooler at the time. He's at school when he collapses in sudden cardiac arrest. Underneath Ian, that second photo is a school nurse who grabbed the AED and who applied it to him and delivered a shock that returned his heart rhythm. One thing that's very unique about this particular case is that of the Escondido Unified School District, they had one AED throughout the entire district at that time. And that AED happened to be at Ian's school when he had his arrest. And another little twist to this story, the teacher who took it upon himself to do the fundraising to raise the money to buy the AED that saved Ian, Ian was in his class at the time. So definitely all, everything aligned to make that successful save happen. Uh, but we don't want to leave it to chance. We want to leave it to a lot of preparation. And so next slide, please. I just want to thank you for joining today. Uh, we're going to talk about the fundamentals of establishing an AED program on your campus. Even though you could very well have limited resources to do so, you as a designated healthcare professional, your role in education, maintenance, compliance, and then a quality assurance, quality improvement process. And I imagine we have some of you who already have some AEDs in your system, but how can we really maximize the effectiveness of our programs? How can we expand and enhance the programs that are already up and running in your schools? It's important to get a lot, the key is getting stakeholders on board and part of your team. So we'll talk about how we select those people and how we get buy-in. And then at the end, I'd like to talk a little bit about our program here in San Diego in terms of what we're doing with large uh, mass training of CPR for students and then give you a couple of case studies of the successes of having these devices accessible on campus. Slide, please. So I am part of San Diego Project Heartbeat. Uh, we are a program of San Diego Fire Rescue Department and American Medical Response Rural Metro Ambulance. And um, we are a countywide program. So we help support AED programs um, all throughout our county. We work with approximately or over 25, 26 school districts throughout our county, including San Diego Unified, which is the second largest school district in the state of California after Los Angeles. There are about 130,000 students uh, at 200 plus schools and have an operating budget of over a billion dollars. So they're a very large district. And I'm pleased to report that we've helped place AEDs in all of their traditional schools and in many of their facilities. So I'll talk a little bit about what are some tips. Your district might not be that large. How can you, um, how can you come up with ways to enact a program? So we were started in 2001, Project Heartbeat, the program, to help places of all types get these newfangled AED devices out there in the community. So we targeted airports, public buildings, libraries, churches, schools, other places of worship, Basically, anywhere where there's a fire extinguisher, we want to see an AED because, as you know, uh, sudden cardiac arrest is one of the leading causes, is the leading cause of death in our country. So we want people to be prepared. We want to put the life-saving tools in the hands of the public. Other services that we do provide, we help with the training and maintenance. We are a CPR training center. We also are on call to respond 24-7 to any AED responses that happen uh, among our members within our jurisdiction where we go out and we download the EKG data and we also are able to transport this to the emergency room or other areas of the hospital where the patient is at at the time and pass that information off to the staff that's caring for the patient. We also are all, our team is trained in critical incident stress fusing. So oftentimes we'll be called 
called in to provide help to the responders. There's so much emphasis, so much push on teaching everyone in the community to do CPR, but we have a program has always uh, understood the importance of following up with people who might have used the AED and they're very um, shaken up by having been involved in this event. So slide please. So let's just go ahead and get in there and jump in and get started. A uh, recent study in the Journal of the American College of Cardiology looked at the report of AEDs in schools, where are we at? That map on the left-hand side lets us know about different AED uh, states across the country who are requiring AEDs in their schools. The state of California does not require AEDs in schools. However, we've been working to do that. In fact, the, one of the first uh, municipalities in California, the city of Carlsbad, which is in our, uh, our county, they were the first ones to have a district-wide AED program to our knowledge. So uh, that's just a map. We'd like to see that map very full. Uh, we want every school eventually to get this requirement. But until that happens, we're depending on you. We're depending on the health advocates uh, in your district to move this forward. And the link to that article is also there if you want to have a read through the entire article. Slide, please. So here is the million dollar question for those of you who don't have perhaps um, AED, an AED program yet, you're looking to start one. Really for most districts, it's how do we pay for it? Slide. Well, ideally you should be using your budget, right? But I understand that maybe we don't have budget to buy these. In fact, maybe you're like many districts where it's just very difficult to even get the money to buy the basic supplies that you need. So what are some potential funding sources to start up an AED program? Slide. Well, ideally you could get your budget. You could put it in for your principal or at your district level and you could get these AEDs purchased. Uh, another really good resource are grants and we'll talk about what grants are and we'll talk about how you can apply for them and some different places to look for them in terms of different groups in your communities that do have monies that go towards important community projects. Perhaps there's school bond money that's available. Here in our county, we had a, the uh, some school bonds. They were making improvements to the school facilities and some of the districts were able to utilize some of those funds that were earmarked towards that to purchase AEDs to improve their schools as well. The importance of not overlooking the parent-teacher organization, the PTAs, the PTOs, and their involvement in the schools. Your schools or your district might have a nonprofit 501c3 foundation that you can use to raise this money through. And then we have community donors. And maybe your municipality wants to do this. So we'll talk a little bit about that. For example, one of our elected officials here in the county of San Diego, uh, they designated many years ago when these things were just becoming popular, they designated uh, funds to outfit all of the schools in their district with AED. So all of our schools in the south part of our county have had AEDs for many years now is based upon an elected official who used discretionary funds to do it. So there's just a lot of different ways to look into it. Slide please. So if you are building it into the budget, you want to look at how, you know, how many do we need? How should we do this? Should we buy them all at once? Should we phase them in? With uh, San Diego Unified, what, when we were working with them, and we've been working with them for many years to get this accomplished, uh, their AEDs and all their schools, we decided, okay, well, we have a limited number of funds. Let's go ahead and start with the high school. Um, that's you have larger student populations, and then you have also a, lots of adults on school. You have athletics programs. So we believed that they were going to be, at least in our case, the priority to get AEDs placed there first. So we wanted to get one in each school first um, for those high schools and then our middle schools and then our elementary schools and then go back and look at these schools, the high schools, the middle and the elementary to see do they need more AEDs on campus because some of them are quite large, as you know. So your school board might be involved in this. It might be something that just, just takes place at the uh, at the school level. Uh, you might just go to your principal, say we need to get these, and you budget, and you are able to procure this AED. Or it might need to go to your board level. You need to go in front of your school advisors or your school board 
and petition them for this project. Or perhaps it is a city council or your county council or mayor, your board of supervisors, however your municipality is set up. It might be something that they could start and build in with. And also, too, one source of funding, look to your, your fire departments and your emergency medical services systems. They have, you know, a lot of resources and a lot of ability to be key allies for you in this. Now, you might also want to approach manufacturers about any special programs and partnerships. I encourage you as you're looking at the different products um, through School Health, and uh, I encourage you to find out what is out there, some what works for your organization. Uh, our organization, Project Heartbeat, we have a partnership with Cardiac Science, the AED um, manufacturer that we we're working with. And uh, so they've, that's been very beneficial to our program in terms of helping us grow and get AEDs in schools. And then one thing that's also very critical, and don't overlook this in the excitement to get AEDs, is that they need replacement parts couple years down the line, they're going to need those replacement electrode pads. And a couple years after that, they're going to need replacement batteries. So we have had instances where AEDs have been donated to the schools or purchased for schools. And then later on, they don't have the money to keep them running. And what's worse than not having an AED is having an AED and then you had to take it out of service because the battery went dead and you couldn't afford to buy a new one. So when you're looking at the long term of this, look at how are we going to buy these replacement parts to make sure that this thing is always rescue ready, always good to go. And that's really going to be your role as the health designate at your school. Next slide, please. So I love this picture. That's uh, taken out in front of our school, our uh, district offices, our San Diego Unified. Here we have the Iron Skulls Motorcycle Club. And they are donating on this day three AEDs to the San Diego Unified School District. And we have some members from the, um, our local elected officials office out there. Now their connection to this cause, one of the members of the club, his daughter died on a school trip. They were basically, they were on a team and they were on a bus going to a tournament, an away tournament. She collapsed in cardiac arrest and uh, did not unfortunately survive that event. So as a result, this club, motorcycle club, got together, and they um, they per they fundraised, they purchased the AEDs, and when they delivered them, they all drove up on their motorcycles, and I had it in off school district. So it just it had everything. It was very visual. It is very moving. We had a lot of media there, but I think it also well is, illustrates the point is that really what's going to move this forward is the involvement of people who have a connection with it. So don't underestimate the people in your community whose lives have been touched by this. And, you know, it might not be something that's on someone's radar until they have someone in their life who's been touched by a cardiac arrest and it changes everything and it makes them really big advocates of this program. So think about that as you go to move this forward. Slide, please. So grants are a source, a very effective source of being able to pay for your AED program. What's a grant? Well, basically a grant is an amount of money that's made available. Organizations of all types, um, even you know the government has grants, just blocks of money that they give away to different organizations to enact important programs. So we've been very successful here in terms of AED grants for schools. I've done a lot of grant writing. Um, you might have someone in your organization who is the designated grant writer. So if you find out, if you know this person, go to them and talk about the potential of looking for grants. And there's a lot of online resources to, to investigate different grants in your communities. Um, sometimes grants come from hospital districts. Sometimes they come from charitable foundations. Sometimes they come from service organizations like your Kiwanis, your Rotary, your Optimus. Sometimes um, donors in the community want to step up. Uh, anybody who's set, any organization that's set up as the, the tax designation, the government designation of 501c3, you might have seen that, basically means they're a nonprofit organization and they're allowed to accept donations that become tax deductible. So when you're writing them, and I've had the opportunity to write many of them, they just they write themselves really. It's it's you have something that helps kids, you have something that helps 
public safety, emergency responders. You have something that makes the entire community safer. They sh when Once you write a basic stock pitch for a grant, you basically have written the bulk of every grant you're going to need to write. So anything you can put in in terms of compelling stories is helpful. Um, you might be called upon as, as if it's a large grant, the organization might want to come in and have you give a presentation to them as you're seeking it. But one thing I also want to focus on is as you're we're writing a grant or you're working with someone to write this grant, really show the giver, the organization or the individual how this fits into the mission of their their desire to give. You know, what is the value for them? Yes, it's very important uh, to give and to be charitable if you're a big organization, you know, private or government, but show them how it fits into their overall strategic giving program. And that's important. Make sure you meet that criteria. And don't think the criteria is very rigid. Just look at this is why this is so important for you. This is what you get out of it. That's important, too. And we've had nurses who have school nurses and other health techs who have gone out and written their own grants. So these two um, photos on the right, at the top, we have an AED that was donated. Uh, we put patches on the AEDs that get donated. And I think that serves a couple purposes. One, when everybody walks by and sees that AED, they know who gave to get that AED placed. We sometimes will put in memory of a person that that AED was donated in. So those are the patches that we use. That particular one, AED, was donated by uh, one of our healthcare system script, the Division of Cardiology script screen. So instead of giving each other Christmas gifts one year, uh, our, this group of cardiologists, they basically, they pulled their money, they donated it to Project Heartbeat, and we purchased a couple of AEDs that got put in schools. So again, funding sources, AEDs can come from different places. The photo below that, we were recently able to outfit Alpine Unified School District. They're a smaller uh, district, a little bit east of San Diego, and they are in our county. And for years, we've been working with them. They're a small town, so it was hard to get funding. But we were able to connect them with this great organization called the Eric Peretti's Save a Life Foundation, and I will talk about them a little bit later, who were just this past year able to purchase AEDs that went into all the schools. So we're finally able to accomplish that. Slide, please. So when you're looking, okay, I want to start this. Who do I put on my team? Well, you are the healthcare point of contact for this school. So you are the advocate. You're going to be the cheerleader for this program. You're going to be the road show. You're going to serve a lot of roles on this. Um, <clears throat> you want to get your administrators, your principals, your school board members, the people who, you know, have budget connections in your organization. You want to get parents on involved. And are there other schools in your area that maybe have AEDs and you don't? Why not bring that up when you're talking about this? You want to get community advocates. Our Project Heartbeat program was started by um, really one of the genesis came from a community advocate, Karen McElliott, who lost her husband to a cardiac arrest. And in their grief, they wanted to help put these AEDs out in the community. And their family is still very much involved in our helping save lives through placing AEDs in all types of places, including schools. And they've personally donated AEDs to many schools in the community. Politicians also are a very good resource for these. It's good for them in terms of the profile and in terms of them having resources. On the right, we have that photo. That is one of our former city council members, Jim Medaffer. He was uh, very instrumental uh, years ago in starting up San Diego Project Heartbeat, a big cheerleader on the elected official municipality level uh, to help us get these AEDs. Now, council member Medaffer has carried an AED in the trunk of his car for about the past 15 years. One day he and his wife are driving home from Costco and someone flags them down on the side of the road. And um, there's a man who's unconscious on the ground, a jogger had collapsed. He takes out the AED, defibrillates him and saves his life after all that time. So really a full circle for him in terms of seeing the result of his effort. But do, don't shy away from involving your politicians. They can be very good allies for you when starting this program. Um, you can not ever 
as a healthcare provider, uh, emergency responder perhaps, someone in uniform, you can talk to the importance of AEDs and the importance of CPR access, but you can never talk as loudly as a survivor, someone who can tell their story. And we go in front of organizations, we go in front of groups all of the time to talk about it, but once we bring in a survivor, that just is a game changer. It becomes a no-brainer. Yeah, we've got to get these AEDs. And then you should also be building relationships with someone in your fire department or your emergency medical services if it's not ours is fire-based. But you really need to get the emergency responders on board because they're the ones who are going to be coming to this incident and they're the ones who are your allies. So if your fire department has uh, EMS involved, ask to speak to the EMS chief or find out who does their AED program or their public access defibrillation pad program and just reach out and let them know this is what we're thinking, what do you have available, and they will be key allies for that. Slide, please. So what are the steps? We're looking to deploy these. First of all, you want to just evaluate where you're at. Where do we need AEDs? Who's going to be the assigned program manager? Who's going to look out after these um, AEDs? Who, what's your, pro, your plan for making sure they're being maintained? Um, doing a walkthrough of your sites, where would we put them? How many do we need on campus? And then you want to review the AED laws and reg regulations. So that's going to vary by state. Uh, some of you have different requirements. Um, some of you are required to have AEDs in your schools. So this is very important. You don't want to overlook that. I mean, it might slog down the process if it has to go through risk management or legal, but it's a critical component because when you put these out there, you want to do it in a way that protects the users of the AED and the district, uh, providing that indemnification. So it takes a little bit time, but it's definitely important to make sure that you're doing this right and doing it protected. When you prepare, you're going to want to look at your AEDs, choose one uh, that fits your needs and that is from a trusted and reliable brand. You're going to want a medical direction for it. You might have a district medical director. Um, ours has always been our city of San Diego uh, fire department medical director, Dr. Jim Dunford, who is a huge advocate of public access to fibrillation. You want to have your deployment plan and then you want to look at, okay, we're going to put these out there in the community, or excuse me, in our school community, who's going to teach people how these are used? Um, who's going to train them? Uh, how are we going to communicate that you don't need to have a CPR card, you don't need to be certified to use it? It's truly like a fire extinguisher. Anybody who needs it in an emergency, grab it and use it. And you might find in your schools that there are people who are very reluctant with the thought of I wouldn't know what to do. I, I would be scared to act. Uh, so how do you intervene with that is training. And you might find, for example, like here where we're at, teachers to get their teaching credential are required to take uh, or to have their CPR certification, but they're not required to keep it up or current. So we might have people who had CPR a long time ago, but they haven't taken a class in years and they're not up on the most recent. So there's different ways you can do it. Some people have an internal CPR um, that where the nurses or someone, the, the athletic directors are also CPR instructors and they teach. Uh, sometimes they use an outside organization. Sometimes the fire department trains folks. So just kind of look at how are we going to train? And every every time an AED is placed in a school, there should be some kind, at least a little like 15, 10, 15 minute in service. This is what we got. This is why it's important. Don't be scared to use it. You're not going to hurt anybody from using this AED. When you put it on, it analyzes the heart rhythm. If the person doesn't need to be shocked, it will not shock. The AED decides if the shock is deployed, not you, the user. And then also there are laws and procedures in place that protect you as the user of an AED. I think those are the two clear messages that I try to get out to every crowd that I speak in front of. And then finally, when you're ready to go, you purchase your equipment, you deploy it, you train people, and then you set up a good program maintenance. Who is going to be designated to be inspecting this AED? What is your inspection schedule? Who's responsible for purchasing replacement items and making sure they get in there? And who, another thing that we do again on the follow-up end, 
who's going to, if this AED deploys, who's going to get the EKG information off of it and take it to the hospital and get that important information to the doctors and nurses and team caring for this person? And then if you do have an incident, who's from a quality assurance, quality improvement program, who's going to go back and review it? And who's going to go back and give feedback to these responders that used it? How can we make sure that what we what happened worked well? And um, how do we improve for next time? Slide, please. So you might be one of those that go, okay, well, you know, that's great. We have AEDs here. Are you maximizing your program? We really work off the American Heart Association's target two to three minute response time for the AED. So I can get from the side of that unconscious person to the AED and back to that person in two to three minutes. And think about some of the sizes of your campuses, particularly your high schools. Um, would you be able to do that? So that's something you also want to keep into account. Um, are you doing emergency response drills? Um, do you have a way to train students and CPR and AED? And do you have enough AEDs? And looking at non-traditional, quote unquote, non-traditional places for them, could they be in health offices, for example? Uh, that's the, the normal place where you'd find them. What about in your gyms, uh, in your theaters? Do you have a mobile AED that can travel with the teams when they go away? So you, for example, might be very confident that you are um, that your AED is, program is up and running. But what about when you send your kids off to the comp competing school to play a sports game? Are they providing that level of protection? So we've had a lot of schools add them to for away games um, or to have on the field. What about on your student transportation systems? Are there AEDs on the buses? And if you have campus police officers who go to your who patrol your campuses, do they have AEDs? So you might go, yeah, okay, well we have an AED, but let's look at this from a comprehensive wraparound standpoint. Do we have the maximum number? Are we providing maximum protection? Next slide, please. So some more, just some special considerations for AEDs in schools. Uh, think about access for after-school activities. I know placement is always a thought of how do we secure, keep it secure versus how do we keep it accessible. Um, so the most common place you're going to have it is in the nurse's office, which is typically not going to be open and unlocked after school or the front office. So how do we have a plan? Who has access to it? Who has keys? Who can get to it? What's our emergency plan? I know here in California, schools are actually required to make access for all after school, school sponsored activities. Um, also too, uh, who's going to download that AED, take it to the hospital? Uh, you might look to, do we need pediatric electrode pads? Uh, so some of our schools have opted not to have them because they don't necessarily have a lot of small children on campus, um, and of course, in a pinch, uh, the American Heart Association it is, uh, does approve the use of adult size electrode pads on a pediatric patient. The thought being, you're putting, you know, an AED on a child. That is the absolute worst case scenario. Go ahead and go for it. Uh, how are you going to train your staff? Uh, what about letting your neighbors know you have an AED on campus? For example, one of our schools decided that they wanted to go ahead and mount the AED. Uh, on an outside wall by their field where it's, it's a park that's open to the community and sports teams play in there. So they wanted to make sure that their neighbors knew or anybody who's using the field on off hours know that there was an AED there. Now, obviously, we're San Diego. The weather is not going to be as much of an issue um, as other areas, but just something to keep in mind. Do people in the community know? You might also have students who have uh, diagnosed cardiac conditions, who have special needs, who have an AED that's assigned to them, that goes with them through a, like an individual education plan or an IEP, for example. But that AED, to, at least from what I understand in our district, it moves with the child. So if the child goes to a different school, the AED goes with them. So just know that that's something also that might be out there. And then you might want to think about some of the technology available in your community. San Diego is a Pulse Point community. Uh, Pulse Point is a bystander CPR app that was created a few years back to that 
provides, it does two things. It provides a GIS located map of AEDs of defibrillators that are all around you. So you can pull it up on your phone and see where a lot of AEDs are. As well, it's tied into the 911 dispatch center. So when we send out a call for um, paramedics to respond, or emergency paramedics, EMTs, firefighters to respond to a CPR, if you're within the vicinity of this incident, it will send an alert to your phone. And the thought being, well, you're on scene already, you could potentially go help this person and be there for a few minutes doing CPR um, until those emergency responders first res are able to get there. So it's basically crowdsourcing life-saving your community. Do you have, are you a Pulse Point community? Um, and if you don't, how do you become a Pulse Point community? Might that be something that you might be interested in? Slide, please. So we, these are just a couple pictures from AED uh, donations that we've had. And again, I think it's very important to acknowledge the donor, the nature of people who are very charitable. They typically don't like this. They don't want to be acknowledged for it. But I think it's important for a couple of reasons. One, it raises awareness uh, for this. And two, it helps encourage more donations. Um, and, the, and the donor, the giver, gets to see the direct connection. Now, I mentioned before the patches that we put on there. So we respond to these AED deployments, and when I go out and respond to these and I see a patch, I then have the opportunity and have had the opportunity to make phone calls and go, you know, hey, that AED you just donated, um, that just AED just saved a life. And so this person now gets the dramatic connection between their donation and now a life save. We've had a donor, Bobby Cohen, um, who tragically lost her husband in a cardiac arrest incident um, at their daughter's wedding. And she and her family have raised money to place AEDs, and the AEDs they have placed have saved two lives so far. So just a nice legacy. And again, those connections, that heartfelt thing, make a big deal out of it. It's important, and it keeps the donations coming. Next slide, please. So in terms of uh, training, we do a lot of training in schools. Uh, these are two um, instances, two high schools we were at, where we do just a basic hands-only CPR class with the, the students and then uh, show them an AED, a quick rundown. So we've trained, we probably train tens of thousands of students a year throughout our county, uh, typically middle school and high school, but not necessarily. We have one school here that's designated a heart safe school and they have us come and do a K, train all their kids K through eight. It's uh, obviously tailored to their age, uh, the appropriateness, but we've had a lot of success doing that. Kids, even though they're small, can get the concept of what CPR is and what an AED is. And they tend to be pretty comfortable with the technology and able to hop in there and use it. So with these mass trainings, uh, they typically, we set up in the gyms or the multi-purpose rooms and we set out our mannequins and then the kids, instead of going to PE, they just rotate through and, and come in and get their presentation. There's this great tool now, the CPR in schools kits, which you're seeing in the middle there. I mean, I believe Schoolhouse has those available. They are like duffel bags, which is your kit. So our ideal is to be able to get these kits placed in the schools or maybe clusters of schools and then train someone at the school, be it the athletic department, the athletic instructors, or you know someone else to become the CPR instructor, and then they're able to train the students. So that's, that's really the goal that we're looking at with that. But we personally ourselves are involved in CPR training all of the time with schools. Next slide, please. One thing too, uh, get your public safety folks to come out. This photo was taken from um, San Diego Academy. It's in Encinitas, a little bit north of San Diego. Uh, the fire chief there wanted to train all of his seventh graders in CPR. So we went through, we're in a dance class in this situation. You'll see a number of emergency responders there, our public safety folk coming out to help. The paramedic and the EMT uh, from the ambulance are in this crowd. They came to this event after having run a CPR call where they saved a man. So they basically just walked in from a CPR save and taught CPR to these kids. So again, the importance of getting your public safety folks on board. Don't be scared to join them, as you're, have them join you as their partner in this. Slide, please. 
We have a lot of outreach we do on college campuses. In fact, right after this, I'm running over to one of our community colleges for a health fair where we're going to be teaching CPR. We've had a lot of success on college campuses as well. Next slide, please. So I wanted to just uh, talk real quick about this nonprofit organization, the Eric Peretti Save a Life Foundation. They provide free cardiac screenings for young people roughly ages 12 to 25. Um, they were started in honor of Eric Paredes, who was 14 years old when he collapsed on the kitchen floor in cardiac arrest. His dad, who was a highway patrol officer, actually just came home for lunch, found him unconscious. Unfortunately, he had too much downtime. Eric did not survive this event. But his dad and then his mom, who is an RN at um, Scripps Green Hospital, they started this foundation so other families would not have to experience this. So they've helped screen over 20,000 students so far in a short period of time. Every time they do a screening, uh, they find a handful of kids who need um, some kind of follow-up attention, sometimes immediately. Because like Eric, the vast majority of kids who die of cardiac arrest, no one knew if they had anything wrong with them until they collapsed on the ground and they were not conscious. So they've been very generous to our organization epsavealife.org is their website if you want to find out more information about them. Next slide, please. Let's just end with a couple of case studies. Uh, this one was from last year. This 16-year-old uh, male was at school. He had no history of cardiac disease. He collapsed while walking to class. So, you know, it's a little bit easier to fathom if, yeah, this kid's playing volleyball, they're running track, they're involved in a you know intense physical activity but this was not the case so school staff witnessed it they respond then they had the nurse respond with the aed one shock was administered and then cpr was continued so upon arrival the paramedics did uh, detect a pulse on this patient go ahead and read the next or change the next slide please so this is a picture of the slide so um they, this student was clearly in ventricular fibrillation when the AED was placed. Uh, at the bottom, you see that shock administered. One thing I do want to point out, uh, this, the EKG, and this is from, they, some of them look different. This is from the cardiac science brand, but they're like the black box of the call. So we see here um, second by second what happens, and they had this AED open and applied to that student in about 22 seconds, which is very remarkable on that. So at the bottom, you see the shock. Next slide, please. And then after that, uh, you see some pause, and then you see some electrical activity start up again. And um, you see, of course, some compression artifact on top of it, but the student did eventually regain pulses and had a good turnout. Um, and one illustrating also the importance of follow-up, uh, my teammate, Lisa, firefighter paramedic, was able to get out to the hospital, pass this AED EKG to them, and it was very, very helpful in terms of their being able to um, provide the right follow-up care for this, this patient, this young man. And, um, you know, oftentimes when this person is resuscitated on scene, they become conscious, they're able to talk to their emergency responders. Uh, the doctors and nurses never really know what their initial presenting rhythm was, but it's captured on the AED EKG. So that's the importance of getting quick follow-up with someone to download it um, and take care of it. Next slide, please. Next case study is uh, also from last year, an 81-year-old male. He is on campus in the high school gym watching a high school basketball game. He does have a fairly extensive cardiac history. Um, he collapses in the stands. This is witnessed from the athletic trainers who are on the court. They run up the stairs to this man. They put the AED on. They administer one shock, and he regains pulses. And uh, they are able to ask him, what's your name? And the man wakes up and tells them his name, which is very remarkable. Next slide, please. This is the EKG from that. Um, and this is pretty much textbook. This is your best case scenario. We have a course VFib arrest going on. Um, we have a shock administered, and then we have a return 
of um, spontaneous circulation. We have a ROSC, we have a SAVE, um, and then of course CPR artifact on top of that. But that's why we, that's textbook how it's supposed to happen, and that's what's happening all over the place in schools that are getting AEDs. Now you know that an AED is not going to save everybody. Um, still, despite our best efforts to place them in schools and use them and train people in CPR, it's still the leading cause of death. So one thing just to remember that if you have used an AED and if you perform CPR and it does not save this person's life, that's still very important what was done. It's important for the rescuer because the rescuer knows that they did everything that they could have. Uh, the family does not have to wonder, would my loved one still be alive if someone did CPR or had an AED available? And so, in my opinion, every time an AED used, it's a success in a way because it answers those questions and it gives the person every shot that they've got for survival. And you know that we want these AEDs out there because we need to build the bridge to survival from the time when that patient collapses to the time that those emergency responders get there. We need the public to help keep them going. It's truly an emergency where the public is the lifesaver. They're a partner in saving lives. So I want to thank you for your time today. Um, in terms of, I want to thank you for your interest in starting up one of these programs. And I would hope that out of this, you'd just be motivated to you know, get out there and look at your plan. Maybe if you could, everyone just today or by the end of the week, just take one step, contact one person to get the ball rolling on this. It's a very exciting program. It's a very important program, and it's something that can save lives. So I'm going to put my contact information up there. Uh, please feel free to contact me after this if you want to talk a little bit about it or you have specific questions that we can't get to today in this remaining few minutes, and I'd be happy to help you out. We have had the privilege of working with uh, organizations all across the country who want to learn more about it. And we've had a very successful program and we want everyone to have the success that we have had. So with that, we'll go ahead and um, take some questions. Thanks, Laura Lee. Uh, we have received a, a couple of questions during the presentation. So we'll go ahead and, and start through those. Um, just to remind everyone, if you do have a question for Laura Lee that, uh, that you would like us to address now, go ahead and submit your question through the questions interface in GoToWebinar. Uh, we'll start off with a question from David who says, uh, it is a question about um, training on AEDs. Do you need to be a certified CPR instructor to train staff on an AED? You do not need to be a certified instructor to train staff on an AED. To, if you wanted to certify people, you would need to have a trained instructor. But so much of the emphasis these days is moving away from, quote unquote, certifying people to teaching people. Um, we do instruction. We actually have like um, CPR days in the public where we go out and we throw mannequins in the public. We take people for a minute or two and teach them the basics. So. A handful of people might need to have their CPR certification for their position, but everybody can just be taught by um, a quick demonstration by anyone. And also, too, you could also um, just send out, you know, a YouTube or a link to a video to watch the how the AED works as well. So there's lots of different ways you could educate people. But don't shy away from training because you feel like you don't have the resources to pull everyone in for four hours to teach them and certify them. Not necessary at all. Just teach everyone to use the AED because everyone needs to know where it's at and that they can use it. Good question. Thank you for asking. Great. Uh, got another question. Of course, we've all heard uh, a lot recently about uh, the opioid epidemic that is around. Ellen asks, if you're working in a high school and a student drops, would you start with an AED or would you consider um, using something uh, like Narcan for uh, a possible opioid overdose? Well, you know, you're going to want to go over all your product protocols with your medical director, but um, your priority is going to be getting the AED on scene and starting that CPR, keeping that person going, and then doing, you know, if you have that Narcan available, um, and it all happens very, very fast. 
So just, you know, get your, get your person, get them compressions if they're not breathing. Um, if you have your Narcan, you can administer that as well. So kind of just, it's, it's going to all happen really fast, but yeah, have all those tools ready to go. Okay. We've got a couple of questions that have come in about laws. Uh, Lara and Sam uh, both say, um, how can we find out about laws protecting someone who uses AEDs in a public place? And also, how can we find out about the laws that uh, make sure that we're meeting our state guidelines with AEDs? So, a uh, great question. So, most, I believe almost all states have some kind of Good Samaritan law, which covers uh, the liability. It basically says if you are in good faith going to help someone in an emergency, that you um, are legally protected in that instance. So uh, the state of California has additional laws in the health and safety code that are specific to AEDs, so they provide an additional layer of protection. And also your, you know, again, getting when you start getting it set up, you're going to your legal department and making sure that you have proper protocol and procedures and training and maintenance measures and documentation in place. That will also help it. Um, in terms, you could just go online and find out. Um, I believe Cardiac Science even has on their website, you can look up AED laws in your state. So uh, that, that article referenced earlier has uh, those states that do have AED laws enacted. Um, you could look there, but you could just honestly just do a Google search for AED laws in schools, and um, that could give you the information you need. Great. Uh, we've got a question from Melinda, and it's a question about education. Um, she asks if school nurses should be trained to educate others on this. I'm going to assume that you're going to say yes, Laura Lee. So let's add a little bit to that question and say, where is a good place for a school nurse to start? Right. So, um, you know, you have a lot on your plate, you school nurses. I know at least here, sometimes our nurses oversee multiple schools, one nurse. So try to decentralize this as much as possible. Who does it go to? The next logical step, I think, would a lot of times be someone who is in the athletics department because they're typically already required to have to have their CPR AED certification. You might also look outside of that. You might go, we have a parent here who's a nurse or an emergency responder. Could they come in and help with this? Um, but Typically, again, ultimately, the person people are going to look to when this incident goes down is you, the, the health tech or the health professional at the school. And, you know, look at, with your fire department, too. They might have uh, training that they offer uh, to the community, sometimes at no charge. So there's lots of different places, and there's lots of different vendors, uh, private companies who can come, come in and train as well. Great. A uh, question from Deshaun, who says, if an AED is used, uh, will the hospital be able to get the information uh, from the AED? Uh, is it taken to the hospital with the patient? I know we touched a little bit on this during the presentation, but if you could talk some about that, Laura Lee. I can't say for certain that 100% of hospitals like this are like this, but typically a hospital is not going to be able to download the EKG with the patient. It might be your municipality, your fire, your responders, they take the AED with them. That might be their protocol. Um, but generally, it's good to have, at least in our case, we need to have someone else who downloads it and prints it out and takes it in there um, or sends it over. So for your, for your jurisdiction, check with your emergency services to see their final protocol on that. Um, but here, we don't have a prospect. We our, our paramedics and firefighters are instructed, leave the AED on scene. We'll come out and take care of it. Good question. Great. Got a question from Melinda on the cost of an AED. And I'm going to refer uh, Melinda to our website, schoolhealth.com. We do have a number of different options of AEDs available. Uh, costs vary uh, depending on uh, the, the, the kind that you're getting and the, and the resources that you're looking for from the AED. Um, another question here. Uh, on training in a school, who should be trained and how often should uh, that training happen or, or reoccur for people who are already trained? Well, um, a certification training is every two years. So ideally, you could do every two years. Um, some schools do an annual refresher. When we deploy, I mean, 
ideally you could certify as many people as possible all your like ideally in a perfect world you could certify all your staff some of our districts do that they have the resources for that um, but for those that don't what's recommended is just certifying a core group of people maybe folks who are in the front office you know maybe your campus patrol officers maybe um, your you know, anyone who would be likely to be around when this is being used, your principals should be on board with this as your first tier. And then moving outside from that, um, you know, basically certify a core group, but where everybody should get some kind of awareness level training, even if it's just a handout or a flyer or a watch this video. Everybody should at least see it um, when it's put in there. And then annually, annual notification is our recommendation for reminders and then, you know, certifications every two years. Great, thank you. Uh, I've got a question here on training. Uh, specifically, it says, do you have a training video on AEDs that, uh, that we can watch at our leisure? I know that during the presentation, Laura Lee, you did talk about the American Heart Association CPR and Schools Training Kit. We do have those available at schoolhealth.com. Um, do you know of any uh, video resources, Laura Lee, that, uh, that are available? There's a lot of great video resources available. Um, and again, we use Cardiac Science primarily. They have a YouTube channel that does their AED. Um, but the American Heart Association and the Red Cross just again, go to go to the internet, go to YouTube. There's great like learn CPR in a minute videos if you want to get that basic. Um, I, I don't have one in particular that I recommend, but just go through there and look. There's some great videos online. Okay, great. Well, that's about all the time that we have uh, for today. I'd like to thank everyone for attending today's webinar. Uh, here at School Health, we believe that providing insightful content is a very important part of what we do and how we serve our customers. Uh, we appreciate Cardiac Science very much for partnering with us on this webinar. Sudden cardiac arrest is such an important thing to bring awareness to, and we appreciate them uh, standing up and, and working with us uh, to bring you this presentation. We hope that you found the, the information useful. And a very big thank you to our presenter, Laura Lee, for taking the time to share her wealth of knowledge with us. Uh, as you're signing out, you will notice that there is a brief survey that will come up on your screen. We would ask everyone to participate in the survey and give us a little feedback on, on how we did here today. Um, helps us improve our processes moving forward and, uh, and, and helps us learn how we can better serve you when we bring this kind of information. That will end today's broadcast. Uh, thank you for joining us and have a good rest of your day.